Hello and welcome to Spotlight on Warsing. My name is Donald Odom, and today's show features Jill Aguano, the community educator and trauma therapist at the Ulster County Family and Child Advocacy Center in Kingston. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm really excited to be here to talk about April being National Child Abuse Prevention Month. This awareness campaign started in 1983 as a time to be able to acknowledge the importance of families and communities working together to prevent child abuse. The pinwheel that you have here was introduced in 2008 as a national prevention symbol to remind us of the innocence and joy in childhood. And if you do this, doesn't it make you happy? It makes me so happy. That's why it was, you know, became the symbol. And you might want to look around in the month of April in the community because there are organizations that will be planting Pinwheel Gardens. Yes. Okay. Many people. Go ahead. Uh, so can you talk about uh, what child abuse is and go a little bit more in depth into Okay. That? A lot of people think child abuse is limited to just physical harm. And actually child abuse includes not only physical abuse, but physical neglect sexual abuse, and emotional or uh, mental maltreatment. Gotcha. Uh, so does child abuse only happen once or can happen more than once? It happens over time. Usually, you know, again, it's not a one-time event. Um, they're subjected to more than one form of abuse. It can start maybe um, a parent will be yelling at a child and um, start calling them names mm -hmm. and start you know lowering the child's self-esteem by calling them stupid and things like that and pretty soon a, ch a parent if they don't have good coping skills might get frustrated and they might hit a child <clears throat> excuse me hit a child push a child slap a child do some of those things um, there can be sexual abuse when we think about um, maltreatment oftentimes people don't realize that um, not having um, proper clothes, like in the winter time, if you don't have a winter coat. Um, some families will experience um, hardship and not be able to have a lot of money to be able to pay for um, rent. You think about utilities, again, especially in the winter time. Um, sometimes they're making choices as to whether or not if a child needs medical care. Um, to pay for the utility bill in order to keep the heat on or take a child to a doctor and get medication. Again, those are types of, of physical um, neglect and abuse that happens. And if someone suspects that there's abuse happening, there's a hotline um, mm -hmm. that they should call. People are used to it being called the child abuse hotline. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's actually called the New York State Public Hotline. It's an 800 number. Um, I think that at school, you'll find it around here. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they've got posters that will say if you suspect abuse okay. or you think you know, that you're being abused as a child, um, to call that number. It's an 800 number. Mm -hmm. It's 342. I'm going to look here. It's 23720. Or if a child's in immediate danger, sometimes children will, you'll see a child being hit. And rather than somebody intervening and putting themselves or the child at greater risk, it's a matter of calling 911 mm -hmm. and reporting that that's happening. Gotcha. So you're here from the Ulster County Family and Child Advo Advocacy Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, just can you talk about a little bit what uh, the FCAC does in cases of child abuse? Well, we're one of the organizations in Ulster County that investigates. When a call has come into the hotline, we respond by investigating. Um, oftentimes people are afraid to make calls to the hotline because they think, oh, if somebody's going to come and investigate, and they're going to take the children away from the parents. Well, the last thing that, that anybody that's investigating a case from the hotline wants to do is take a child away from the parent. And so the investigators from the advocacy center, what they'll do is first of all go to see if that indeed is a case of abuse. And if it's a founded, what we call a founded case, what they'll do is they'll take a look at ways to intervene. Um, sometimes um, things are happening and there's ways that parents can learn different things or, or again, things can happen. Um, but we're there to support um, the circumstances and change them. Again, not take the child out of the home. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, I'll go back to that original statement. Sometimes people are afraid to make a call because they think, oh, DSS is going to come in and take the children. No, DSS doesn't want to. What we want to do is identify what it is that we can do to help that family stop the abuse to the child. Mm -hmm. Could you give some examples of child abuse? Um, child abuse, again, is um, when a child is being hit. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that happens. 
um, because a parent uh, doesn't know parenting skills. Maybe they grew up, you know, and they're used to the idea that if you do something wrong, you know, you're, you're going to spank the child. Mm -hmm. And um, they think that that's, again, corporal punishment is a way to, to be able to discipline. Corporal punishment can become abusive and it's important for parents sometimes to learn other ways. And so when an investigator comes, what they're looking for is, well, maybe the parent doesn't know other alternatives um, to handling a child's behavior. Maybe some of the parent might be having a, a problem themselves with their own anger management. And we might take a look and say, well, there needs to be, you know, somebody attending anger management. And then there might be um, putting a caseworker there to be able to help the family adjust and learn some of those skills and support the person that's learning those new skills. Sometimes a person might have a substance abuse problem that's interfering with their being able to parent um, in a healthy way. And maybe they don't know um, how to, again, access medical services. When I was talking about trying to figure out um, how to pay the bills, sometimes people aren't aware that there's services like um, the Home Energy Assistance Program, and they don't know how to access it. And so by somebody coming in, they can give them that information and um, know what to do and how to do it. So like I say, what we're trying to do is as we investigate you know, identify how that family can remain intact but change the circumstances that were causing it to be abusive for the child. Mm -hmm. What we're wanting to do is, again, reduce that trauma um, that's um, experienced from um, the original set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it shouldn't hurt to be a child, is what you're saying? Absolutely. In fact, that's what the pinwheel is. Mm -hmm. It's a reminder, you know, for a child to be able to have a life of fun, a child, a life of happiness, mm -hmm. and, and go from there. Um, anything that supports children, parents, grandparents, and caregivers in the community helps strengthen the families and reduce the likelihood of abuse. Um, we stop and think about in Ellenville. Um, I, I know you have the Ellenville Warsing Recreation Program that um, has programs throughout the year, uh, as well as their summer camp program. These are th uh, programs that give um, kids the opportunity to um, have other activities, gives the parents a um, break from the child, knows that there's a good place for kids to be, that they're going to be safe, they're going to be well cared for, and the program's gonna be something that's going to help the kids grow and thrive. Mm -hmm. um, you have programs at the library for adults as well as, as for kids that are there. Um, again, sometimes it's a matter of, of a parent learning, you know, what's happening there and saying, yeah, I should plug in there and I should learn whatever that particular class is that they're offering. I know that the hospital offers the same thing. There's a lot of health and wellness programs that they offer, as you have the hospital right here in Allenville. Your school, there are so many things that happen in the school um, where kids have the opportunity to mentor younger kids. Again, just the interactions with the teacher. I'll even, I'll even remember, just in two seconds ago, you said something about Mr. B. Mm -hmm. He's, I've known him for a long time. Yeah. He's really great. Mm -hmm. Well, this is an example of somebody that is helping children develop relationships mm -hmm. and um, understand, you know, how to interact with people and to, to be a role model in different ways. Well, pre-K programs, you know, um, having quality daycare are things that help um, prevent child abuse. And oftentimes people don't think about those as, as what we call abuse prevention programs. They're so ongoing that we don't think about them. But again, sometimes parents are in situations and they kind of lose track of what's available in the community. You also have family of Woodstock here in Ulster County where they have a hotline. And I always like people to remember that that hotline is available 24 hours, seven days a week. It's a matter of getting um, um, to the family of Woodstock's um, website, um, family.org in order to get that phone number. There's a text line for teens, and it's a matter of just calling in and knowing that you're not alone. But what we do is we're looking at all of these different programs that are there to support resilience in children and adults. Mm -hmm. And what is resiliency? Well, let's take a look at this video. Let's see if we can get this queued up. And let's take a look at this video because it's gonna help us be able to understand what resiliency is. Why do some people do well despite serious hardships? 
the science of resilience can help us find answers. We define resilience as a good outcome in the face of adversity. The extent to which we can build capacities in all children early in their lives to be able to deal with whatever bumps in the road or major obstacles may be coming down the track. That's an investment in building strong human capital and healthy, productive adults. Some children face more obstacles and adversity than others. It's like having a parent with a major mental illness, growing up in a very socioeconomically disadvantaged community, going to schools that are not good, being exposed to violence in the neighborhood or, or in the home. But some children do well despite these significant obstacles. Resilience is that ability or set of capacities for positive adaptation, allowing you to keep in balance. We're talking about the kinds of capacities and skills and the abilities that uh, give people a sense of mastery and management of difficulty. It's tempting to think about children as either having this resilient quality or not. But resilience is built over time, just as and in parallel with how the architecture of the brain is built over time. It's not just in the person. It's in the interaction between the person and the environment. So we care about resilience for the same reason that we care about promoting healthy development, because in many respects it is the same. We are interested in, in promoting resilience in children so that, despite the odds, more and more children can grow up to be productive citizens. So, do you know what resiliency is now? Uh, yeah, so um, it's basically not giving up easily uh, and bouncing back when difficult times happen or bad things happen. That's right. It's being able to stick to st doing something rather than seeing everything as a disaster. You know, it's about asking for help, you know, knowing when, how, and who to ask. And again, sometimes the reason to make that call is that the people that are involved in those situations don't know who to ask. They're, they're unsure um, what to do. Gotcha. So it's really about relationships and one knowing that at the end of the day they're not alone. Yep. There's always somebody out gotcha. there. So let's take a look at this video and see um, if we can get more information about uh, adversity and resilience. Millions of children throughout the world are exposed to frequent and damaging stress. <coughs> not all stress is bad. Starting a new school, meeting an adult for the first time, these are experiences that, while stressful, are essential to healthy development. But we know now that chronic, uncontrolled stress is toxic to children. Stress becomes toxic when the body's neuronal and hormonal defense systems are frequently activated. Toxic stress increases a child's risk of developing heart disease as an adult, and many other physical ailments. Toxic stress can trigger emotional and behavioral issues with far-reaching consequences. In the first place, we would, we would like to prevent the kind of extreme adversities that children should never experience. But things happen. I mean, often we are trying to help children who have already experienced terrible adversity, and they've been affected by it. Even when preventing toxic stress is not possible, research suggests that we can help children develop resiliency, a way of coping with the stress and mitigating its damaging effects. Critically important for developing the capacity for resilience are relationships with people that are teaching you step by step the tools that give you the capacity for resilience. It's a skill set, and it is the uh, ability to have those individuals in our lives that serve as role models that help us develop those skill sets of, yeah, something really bad happened to you. You know, you're okay now. 
and there is hope for the future. I think maybe sometimes society thinks of a resilient kid as a child who's overcome some stress, but has good grades, is in lots of sports, has lots of friends. And for some kids, that's not what is should be expected. And so resiliency for some kids means getting up and going to school every day. It may mean having one good relationship. So there are lots of different things to consider and to work with. If you think of a child's life as a teeter-totter, for some children, many, many risk factors and negative experiences can pile up on one side and it tilts them down and makes it very difficult for them to do well in life. And we have to think about what do we need to do to counterbalance any of those negative experiences that happen or may happen in the future. We want to have a lot of positive experiences and weights of various kinds on the positive side in order to tilt that child's life back in a positive direction. So you may even have a lot of negative factors, but if you have a lot of protective factors, then the teeter-totter will stay balanced or hopefully be weighted more in the positive direction and good outcomes will happen. Perhaps the most important protective or positive factor is the presence of a stable, positive adult in the child's life. A parent, mentor, church member, or even a concerned neighbor can tilt the teeter-totter of a stressed, vulnerable child in a positive direction. While some adults may be contributing to the child's stress, even these relationships can be repaired and that adult can become a weight on the positive side. It is also possible for children who have been moved into foster care to build a positive environment in which to strengthen their resilience. So the other uh, component of a teeter-totter is the place where it's balancing, that fulcrum. For most of us, we probably start out life pretty much in the middle with a balanced kind of teeter-totter and things get added to, to weight it. But some children are born with more risk factors inherent. They may have, uh, may have had a very uh, bad prenatal course. If your mother is going through a lot or doesn't have adequate nutrition or sick or in many other things that could happen, that can affect a child. So a lot of harsh experiences without many protective experiences may well show up in sliding that fulcrum where even one or two more additional negative things can tip you into some poor outcomes. Negative experiences, regardless of how early they've occurred or how much they've shifted the fulcrum, don't need to permanently set the course of a child's life. Loving, supportive caretakers can arrive at any stage to offer protective experiences, tilting the teeter-totter in the right direction and bolstering resiliency for the future. One very important thing about human development is that it's very dynamic, even if a fulcrum is pretty settled in one place, then people can learn to accommodate their own fulcrum. I often do a lot of parent-child work. So I'll t I will demonstrate how to give support and sort of guide a child through something. Then they can take that home and then go through these steps at home. So when a child comes home, is stressed about things, th this is how we come up with a plan. This is how we solve it together. One of the most important things that I do is to have initial respectful engagement, to work to develop a trusting relationship, to offer hope to the family, because when you believe that there is a resolve to the trauma or the adversities that you are experiencing, I believe that creates a level of resilience. I think that most of the kids I see are pretty high on the resilience scale, partly because many of them are asking for help, and I think a big part of resilience is recognizing um, when you need help, especially with an older kids, figuring out who to ask, when to ask, and then how to ask for help. Resilience is on your side in a sense. Human beings have so much capacity to adapt and recover given a good context for that given a supportive environment and you want to mobilize the child's own recovery systems and get them going again.
Do you remember what the protective factors are? Uh, they mentioned uh, relationships, uh, mentors, and uh, stable, supportive uh, relationships, friendships. Absolutely. The relationships were just right there at any, any of the examples that they gave. But how about risk factors? Uh, they talked about a lot of uh, negative experiences, not enough food, poor relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some things that, again, as children are born into situations, um, um, things that happen even before they're born um, that can, can move that scale. Um, did you see again that that fulcrum can mm -hmm. move and but that some things you know even though they're there they're not abusive they're just adverse or they're difficult situations um, perhaps a parent becomes ill or loses a job um, again sometimes it's not a matter of DSS stepping in mm -hmm. it's a matter of us taking a look at things and seeing things mm -hmm. gotcha um, so it sounds like most situations, most issues could be repaired, and that no matter what, you know, humans like me or you, uh, uh, our faults and our failures, we have the capacity to recover. Absolutely. In fact, there's hope, you know, that things can be better, mm -hmm. and that's the most important thing to remember. Um, several years ago, in fact, several, more than seven, it was in, back in the 1990s, there was a first child experience study that was conducted. Over 17,000 people um, participated in it and they named 10 adversities that children um, might face. Some of them were things that are abusive, which can be prevented. Others were the other, what we call environmental um, things that happen that we're not um, having any control over. But again, the reminder that the outcome of the study was that if those things happen, um, they affect you later in life. And the reason that we're always concerned about child abuse is that if there's things that we can prevent to not affect um, people in their adult life, that's what we want to do mm -hmm. and be able to do. Mm -hmm. So thinking that humans have the capacity to recover, it makes sense that when we see something that might be abusive, uh, we should say something so that there could be an intervention in that situation. Absolutely. And again, sometimes it isn't a matter of calling that hotline. It's mm -hmm. a matter of talking to another adult um, to, uh, to be able to, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a look at this last video. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, young people that are identified um, to have had adverse experiences, but again, where they're at right now um, in relationship to them. My father passed away when I was eight years old, and that was really hard. And um, incarceration of a family member. I went through six years of abuse, ages zero through six. I grew up with a father that did drugs like meth, weed, alcohol, and uh, he went to prison for it when I was 11 years old. And uh, when I was a little kid, I thought drugs were good. And um, I started doing them when I was in the third grade. I'm a sophomore now, I'm trying to get off with one. And it's hard. Physical neglect. No. I typically would like search the cupboards and search the fridge and whatever and like scrounge around for anything that I could eat and typically there wasn't anything so um, I didn't get to eat a lot and then um, I got neglected pretty much in every other way. Um, Resilience card is hope. I developed self esteem by realizing that I'm better than my past, that I've moved on from my past, and that I'm not what my past is, and that I'm never going to let my past get to me again. Having clear expectations and rules, that's given me structure, it's, it's given me the knowledge of. Uh, right and wrong, 
Because there are some things that like I I had a feeling were right and wrong, but it was never really taught that way. Learning responsibility helps me because uh, one of my responsibilities here is working with horses, and uh, I get to go out and trim horses' feet and ride horses, brush them, and keep my mind on that instead of things like drugs and uh, just things that aren't good and things that benefit me and are good for me. Also, learning responsibility, it helps me take action for my school and now I'm gonna catch up and graduate. Being able to witness success is, uh, I feel like it's a beautiful thing for a person. It just shows that you, you work hard and your work ethic that got you to where you wanted to be. Um, it kind of shows a lot of potential that you have in that certain thing that you want to be successful at. I model appropriate behavior for myself and then for my future family, hopefully. Model it for myself more right now because I'm trying to break a cycle for abuse. I knew how to drop in two of these guys that are not a drop in on the skate park, so I, I taught them how they fell on their butts a little bit and uh, hit their heads like me. But um, I taught them how to do it. They did it, succeeded it, and uh, yeah. It was fun helping them out, helping me out. Made me feel good for myself. Made me happy to look felt like a teacher. <laughs> when I thought I couldn't count on anyone after that um, to take care of me, so I thought that I had to do it all myself. And then slowly reaching out and being able to um, kind of get help from other people and then to trust other people, you know, to let them in to help you out. And, yeah, I realized that I could do that. And uh, then, you know, in turn, I was able to trust them enough to talk to them about the things that happened. And then, you know, I was able to work through a lot of those, of those problems. Um, so that was a big one. It's a rough life. It's not something you want to do. I got kicked out of school. I went to jail. Now I'm in Jubilee. And uh, it helps. You got some friends here helping me, helping them. So yeah, um, you gotta fail in order to succeed. So uh, there'll be a lot of obstacles in life that you have to climb over. Um, you fall and you just have to get back up pretty much. And eventually, if you just keep going down that path of being able to stand up for you know what you want to be successful at, eventually success will find you. So. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Yes. Pretty uh, amazing. The video talked a lot about uh, the type of work you need to do and the support you need to get in order to succeed and overcome you know, your issues. Absolutely. It's a lot of work and you do need a lot of support. Mm -hmm. So the message in Child Abuse Awareness Month, <laughs> as you see those pinwheels, is to be able to think about how you can be supportive mm -hmm. of other people mm -hmm. in the community. Mm. It shouldn't hurt to be a child. Right? That's right. Gotcha. Uh, so was there anything else you wanted to add today? or I that think that's it. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information. Absolutely. So for more information on today's topic, you can contact the Ulster County Family and Child Advocacy Center uh, at 21 O'Neill Street in Kingston, New York. Uh, their phone number is going to be 845-443-8867. And the email is going to be jagu at co.ulster.ny.us. Uh, thanks for joining us for this episode of Spotlight on Morrison. See you next time.